picture the scene. It's a glorious sunny day and our newly installed solar panels are pumping out loads of lovely green electricity. But wait, my batteries are fully charged and those miserly bean counters at the utility company are paying us a pittance for our exported power. What should we do? Well, the answer's obvious, says my wife. She is the clever one after all. Go and switch the immersion heater on and we'll get some free hot water. Right oh, I say, and off I dutifully go, up the stairs, open the earring cupboard door and pull the switch cord. Back down the stairs, feeling all smug, we settle back in the garden chairs, sun on our faces and cold beers in our hands. What could be better? Later that evening. Did you remember to switch the immersion off, dear? asked the missus. Oh, I say realising it's been on for the last few hours, using expensive imported power keeping the water hot. Not feeling so smug now then, are we? Back up and down the stairs again. We need a better solution. OK, enough of the cheesy intro script. Let's take a look at how we might get the best from our solar power system without spending lots more cash. Before we do, I'd just like to say thanks to everyone who's subscribed to the channel so far as we've now just reached 100 subs, which is really gratifying. Please do consider hitting that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. If you know everything you want to know about solar power energy diverters, then please feel free to jump ahead to the time shown on the screen now. Okay, on with the video then. Before we jump into buying and installing a solar power energy diverter, let's first consider some of the alternative ways we could get the best from our existing solar power system. The cheapest way to make more of the free electricity we're generating is to try to match our demand to the available supply. That might include putting on the washing machine, running the dishwasher, doing some hoovering or mowing the lawn, all of which may use a couple of kilowatts. But these typically need you to be at home during the day and are hence no good if you're out at work. And who wants to mow the lawn when you could be drinking a cold one in the sunshine? Of course, we could add or increase battery storage capacity and thus reduce the amount of excess electricity we're exporting. But whilst this is an attractive option, it's not a cheap one, with an additional battery module costing anything from £1,000 upwards. See this video here for some thoughts on the payback period associated with adding an extra battery to my current system. Taking the battery storage idea one stage further, we could buy a really big battery, i.e. one that comes with a car attached. But buying an EV is a serious financial proposition and well outside the scope of this video. The final option is to see if we could get that Weasley utility company to pay us more for our exported power. The starting point is to look at the SEG export tariff offered by your supplier and then, if you can, switch to one with a better rate. There are also increasing numbers of new tariffs being offered from those specifically targeted at EV owners, like Octopus Go, to those targeted at solar panel and battery storage owners, like the recently introduced Octopus Flux. Depending on your circumstances and whether you have some form of battery storage, be that an EV or not, one or other of these smart tariffs could negate the case for solar power energy diverters completely. I'll come back to my specific export tariff later in the video. So, what is a solar power energy diverter then? Basically, these are a range of devices that allow you to use the electricity from your solar panels to heat the water in a hot water cylinder. Although this schematic is greatly simplified, it gives the basic idea behind them. They are usually marketed under the guise of various names, such as solar panel power diverter, immersion diverter, solar immersion controller, immersion heater controller, etc. etc. But they all pretty much do the same thing. In addition to having various names, their functionality can vary significantly, from something as simple as a timer controller, to a programmable device with boost button and support for dual immersion heaters, to almost a complete energy management system with remote access and mobile app support. Three of the more common products targeted at the UK and European markets are shown here, with brief summaries of their functionality in each case. 
Whilst not in the same ballpark as buying an additional battery module, at costs of anywhere from £200 to £450, plus installation on top, I questioned whether these were really the solution we were looking for. As an aside, when looking to purchase my original system, I was offered the Solar iBoost Plus device by one supplier. On questioning the other suppliers as to whether they could also offer this product, I received varying feedback along the lines of them having had a poor experience when trying to get them to work properly with various battery storage systems. How real this issue was, I can't say, but in the end, I chose not to proceed with the supplier in question and hence didn't get an iBoost Plus or any other form of diverter. If you are considering investing in one of these products, I'd recommend you do some further research particularly around how well they will work with your planned or existing system. Back to the problem in hand though, by now what I decided we needed was a simple low cost option that allowed us to switch the immersion heater on and off and check its status all remotely. This would solve the two main disadvantages of the existing run up the stairs and pull the cord system, i.e. reduce the wear and tear on my poor old knees and avoid inadvertently leaving the heater switched on. Our existing hot water setup is probably pretty similar to a lot of other UK homeowners, consisting of a large hot water tank whose primary heating comes from an indirect coil fed with hot water from a gas fired condensing system boiler, i.e. not a combi boiler. The immersion heater is very much seen as a secondary heating method, either in the case of a gas boiler fault or to provide a quick boost of hot water. In practice, we've never had cause to use the immersion much in the 20 plus years we've been in this house. Now, before outlining the two solutions I considered, I should stress that this video is not a detailed how-to guide. Any electrical work should only be undertaken by a suitably qualified and experienced person. Electricity is dangerous and cause fire, injury and death. So don't risk it. With that message out of the way, the first solution I looked at would have made use of a Carter smart plug from TP-Link. As we already had a number of devices in the house controlled via the Carter mobile app, I knew this would give us the required functionality and visibility we were looking for. Feeding a 3 kilowatt immersion heater directly from a Wi-Fi controlled 13 amp smart plug was definitely not on the cards however. Instead, I would use the smart plug to control a suitably rated 16 amp contactor which would then supply the immersion heater. How's this in a good quality metal enclosure, all earthed and tested and we should have a safe reliable system. I'd leave the existing pull switch in situ as it wouldn't be doing any harm as well as keeping the wiring changes to a minimum. A simplified schematic shows the principle in outline. Again please note this is not a detailed wiring diagram. Totting up the costs for the various items gave a ballpark figure of around 50 to 60 pounds or so, more my kind of number. However, before getting the toolbox out, I thought a quick trawl around the interweb would be worthwhile. Maybe there was an off the shelf solution that would give the same functionality. And indeed there was. The Optimum OPBM IHT WF01 Wi-Fi enabled universal boiler module stroke immersion heater control and that's a mouthful at a cost of less than £40 well within the desired budget. Essentially a Wi-Fi controlled volt free switch capable of handling up to a 16 amp resistive load this device offered the functionality I would have obtained from the combination of smart plug and 16 amp contactor in my home brew concept. Offering a relatively straightforward installation and no need to construct anything custom, this looked like the ideal option. The only slight disadvantage was that it used the C Home mobile app rather than being part of the TP Link Casa product suite. But a quick look at the capabilities of C Home in the App Store and the online documentation indicated it should more than do what we wanted. This was basically to allow remote on off and visual indication and if needed to construct schedules or timed intervals. I've since found out that it's also compatible with the Toyos Smart App although I haven't used or tested it with that myself. So a quick order to Amazon and it was on its way. Note that there's much more detailed information on the device available from TFC Group at the address shown. 
I've included all the links in the description below. The simplified schematic shows the final arrangement. Installation was relatively straightforward. I fitted the unit onto a short length of wood to make it a bit easier to mount on the wall inside the airing cupboard. The existing flex supplying the immersion heater was removed completely. It had seen better days, so now was a good time to replace it anyway. And two new lengths of better quality, correctly rated flex were installed. I previously improved the insulation around the tank, so nothing further was needed. We were good to go. Detailed wiring information is contained within the installer instructions, which make it clear that installation should be undertaken by a qualified electrician only. So, how is it in operation? Simplicity itself. Once configured, we can open up the app and turn our immersion on and off to our heart's content. As long as we've got a Wi-Fi or 4G phone signal, of course. No more trips up and down the stairs or forgetting to switch it off, as we can instantly check the status via the app. Although we have tended not to use the scheduling functionality very much, it's easy enough to create a simple schedule, for example to put the immersion on for a couple of hours. Now I know what you're all going to say, this solution can't automatically detect when to divert your excess solar power, which of course is a key feature of the diverters shown earlier. But I would argue this solution makes use of the most powerful home computer on the planet, the human brain, and your mobile phone of course. For us, if we can see it's going to be a sunny day, we can typically expect, based on past experiences, that our batteries will be fully charged by about noon or 1pm. We can then turn the immersion on for a few hours and get our water heating up, thus cutting down our gas usage. The few quid we spent on additional tank insulation also seems to pay dividends too. If we're not actually at home, an occasional check of a weather app will show any likely changes in the local weather so we can knock the immersion off sooner if needed, and hence not draw from the grid unnecessarily. Is it an all singing and dancing solution? Of course not, but it's significantly cheaper than anything else, and provides all the functionality we currently need. Back to the garden then, and those chilled beers. Of course, this all only makes sense if the figures stack up. Does diverting your solar power to generate free hot water actually save you money? compared to just exporting your excess and using gas instead. Well, as far as I can see, it all depends on your tariffs. Our solar panels, inverter and battery were installed late July 2022. And having quickly seen the excess power we were exporting at the start of August, I went ahead and installed our cheap man's solar diverter. When comparing the SEG export tariff against our gas tariff, I've adjusted the figures to allow for less than 100% boiler efficiency. Whilst our condensing system boiler was A-rated when we had it installed, it's now 11 years old, and although it's serviced each year, I've taken the view it's now probably more towards the bottom end of the B-rated range, at 86% efficient. It's a bit of a guess, but it'll do. As you can see from the table, whilst the figures were by no means overwhelming, we were at least seeing some positive cash benefit compared to exporting and using our gas-fired boiler. And of course, we had the personal satisfaction of doing our little bit to reduce overall gas demand in the face of Vlad the Bad's antics in Ukraine. But then in September, Octopus went and spoiled the party. It is a strange thing to say when a utility company gives you more money by doubling their seg rate to 15p per kilowatt hour. At which point, it's clear that diverting solar power to generate hot water instead of exporting and using gas didn't make financial sense, at least for us, based on the tariffs we were on. With the most recent changes in tariff from April the 1st onwards, the difference has reduced, but it currently still makes more sense for us to export the excess electricity than to divert it to generate hot water. Of course, this may not be the case for you, if you're with British Gas, for example, whose seg rate is truly miserly, then the figures do stack up. And of course, the figures will change again when the EPG goes at the end of June. The moral of this story? Do your own calculations. But maybe it isn't all about the financials. What about the environmental benefit? Surely using your excess solar to heat your water has got to be better than burning more gas. Well, that was certainly my view. 
However, there is a view that, given the current mix of electricity generation sources in the UK today, the environmental benefits may not be as clear as they would first seem. Gary, from the Gary Does Solar channel, does an in-depth analysis of this issue in one of his recent videos. I've put a link in the description below, and it's quite thought-provoking. Clearly, if you're personally committed to going completely fossil fuel free, and have the solar PV capacity to do that, then in my mind the environmental benefit as a whole is clear. For those of us still living with a mix of gas, grid and solar, it's possibly less clear cut. Or am I missing something? What do you think? So, do we use our low cost solar power diverter anymore? Well, on occasions yes. Why? Well it just suits us sometimes, and as we've seen, the cost difference is pretty marginal. I also still think the environmental case is pretty strong, despite the reasoned argument to the contrary. It's for others to sort out the mix of electricity generation sources, but I'm not holding my breath based on the current shower in power. Ooh, a bit of politics crept in there. But in recent months, our little diverter has mainly just sat in the airing cupboard feeling a bit unloved. I'm just glad we didn't splash out on one of the more expensive devices. I think a device like the My Energy Eddy to cost of around £400, possibly only makes sense if you're moving down the 100% electric route, and maybe not even then. Well, I've probably gone on for far too long, so if you've got this far, thanks very much for watching. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Please do comment and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Your feedback is very much appreciated. In the next couple of videos, I'll have our generation and usage data for April, and hopefully an update on my thoughts about whether the new Octopus Flux tariff makes sense for us. Cheers, and hope to see you again next time.